This morning we are continuing our study in 1 Peter. We're going to be in chapter 3, verses 18 to 22. If you'd like to read along in your Bible, I'll uh, let you know in advance. We're going to be reading in just a moment, chapter 3, 18 to 22. And we've been talking a lot about, in 1 Peter, suffering for our faith, suffering for the sake of Jesus Christ, something that, frankly, is not been probably a significant part of most of our lives. For us, uh, now I'm not saying that there haven't been times we have been hesitant to be uh, maybe visible or vocal about our faith, but most of the time when we struggle with that, it's only because we're worried about peer pressure or rejection or something like that. Um, This morning we're going to talk about a good example for us to follow when it comes to the willingness to suffer for the sake of righteousness, for the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, James and I were on a trip this week and uh, had a really fun time, a father-son sort of graduation trip. We were out in the Monterey, California area, uh, and we were in a hotel. And one morning, this guy was by himself in the hotel, and he came over to us. He said, hey, can I ask you to do me a favor? Would you take a picture of me with my, my phone? And uh, so we struck up a conversation, went over, he took his cup of coffee and he sat down on a couch in front of the mirror and he wanted the decor of the hotel in the picture, him drinking his coffee. And uh, we struck up a conversation, his name was Riviera. Um, and we looked at, he wanted us to take a picture, he said he had this Instagram page. And so we, we looked at his Instagram and it was lots of pictures of him just kind of randomly, maybe drinking a cup of coffee somewhere or standing somewhere. It was, it was humorous. Um, and it was a reminder that we live in an age where there's this constant desire for influence. Um, social media has really brought this out in us, that all of us want people to notice us. We want people to admire us. And there's even a name for the the desire now that that you want people to follow you. And isn't that what people are called on social media, right? That that if I want to see Riviera's pictures, I need to be a follower, right, of Riviera's account. Now, what is the name? What do we call people who get the most followers? Influencers, right? Sometimes you will hear now the term that, so-and-so uh, is in the news, and, and you ask, who is that? And they'll say, well, the, all you know is they're an influencer. And you think, what does that mean? Well, all it means is they're kind of famous, but they don't really have any talent or skill. For which they are famous, they're just famous. For, if that's really what, that, what it ends up being, is they're famous apart from some special talent or skill. They're not, they're, you know, if it's a singer, they're a singer. If it's an actor, they're an actor. But an influencer just means someone that influences people, but not because they have any real skill or talent. And we should be a little bit, I think, on guard of this reality that we live in, that nowadays there's just a whole group of people that exist simply to influence what we think and ultimately what we do, right? Well, we've been talking a lot about suffering, suffering for doing good. I hope that some of you are connecting these messages with your life because I think though the suffering we might face when we stand for Christ is not the risk of our lives, it is not the shedding of our blood, there is the very real pressure to simply be quiet or silent or to conform, right? How many of you have ever had a conversation come up where somebody brought up religion or faith or Jesus and you felt like you should say something and you didn't? Anybody? Raise your hand. I have. Okay, most of us, right? Because we simply didn't want to suffer even a little bit for doing what was right or saying what we should have said or something like that. So the question today is, who should we look to as an example in these things? Who should be our influencer? Well, I hope it will not come as a surprise that Peter offers for us this morning in the passage we're going to look at the ideal example that we can look to, to be encouraged of how to stand to do what is right, even if it means we're going to suffer. And guess who that influencer we should look to is? Jesus Christ. So today we get to see the way that God brings about good and blessing 
when we are willing to suffer for the sake of doing what is good. So together this morning, let's read our passage from God's Word, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 to 22. This is God's Word, so let us listen. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels and authorities and powers having been subjected to him. God, would you bless our reading and hearing and doing of your word today? We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, today, strange passage. Uh, we get to a, a part of 1 Peter that has a couple of uh, passages that have a lot of different views about what they mean, and we're going to try to dive in here. I want us to, to kind of hold on to Peter's train of thought. Uh, today's lesson, I think, flows pretty directly from verses 14 and 17. And I'll remind you what Peter has said in verse 14 is that if we should suffer for righteousness' sake, we will be blessed. Hold on to that as a foundational theme of this book. If you should have to suffer for the sake of doing what is right, of your faith in Christ, your devotion to God, the promise is this, what? What? you will be blessed, right? And those of us that raised our hand, when we said there have been times we knew we should have said something, we knew we should have done something, and we didn't. Why? It is because we didn't really believe the blessing was worth the cost of whatever embarrassment or rejection we might face. But Peter says this, if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Verse 17 just reaffirms that. It is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than doing evil. So Peter is trying to tell us, when that time comes where you're faced with the choice, am I willing to suffer whatever it might mean for the sake of Christ, for doing what is right? Do I believe God's going to bless me? He says, well, let's look at Jesus. Let's look and see how he suffered and what blessings came out of the suffering that Christ endured. And I think that's what we're looking at now. We're looking at how is God going to bless when people are suffering for their faith? Can we really believe God would do that and can do that? And the answer is absolutely we can. Now, uh, I, I want to pause here for us to remember once again who wrote this, this letter we're reading, Peter. Peter was an expert on the topic that is being discussed here about willing, being willing to suffer for the sake of what is right, for the sake of Jesus Christ. Because let's remember Peter's life. Peter was an expert in this partly because Peter had failed so drastically at this. Now, remember what happened to Peter the night when Jesus was arrested. You remember this? Uh, Peter, at the Last Supper, Jesus had predicted the disciples were going were to turn away, fall away from him. And Peter had said, no, I'll never fall away from you, Jesus. And Peter said, even if I have to die for you, Jesus, I will never deny you. I will never fall away. So this is what Peter claimed he would do, the person he would be. Jesus, I will be the one that will stand with you even to the point of death. And then a few hours later, when Jesus was being seized by a crowd of chief priests and elders that had swords and clubs, there was an armed mob there, all of the disciples fell away, every single one of them, including Peter. 
And then while Peter was waiting to see what was going to happen to Jesus after he was arrested, three times he was confronted by people saying, weren't you one of the associates of Jesus? Weren't you one of his followers? We're almost sure that we saw you with him. And Peter denied it three times saying, I never knew him, right? Peter is an expert on standing in the face of suffering for the name of Jesus Christ because he had failed so drastically. He had promised Jesus he would never fall away even if he had to die. And then a few hours later, three times he said, I never even knew Jesus. I don't know that man at all. And then Peter, who had denied Christ to save his skin, heard that rooster crow and he went out and he wept bitterly. And then, of course, he had to watch as Jesus suffered the pain and the injustice and the brutality of the cross alone because all of his disciples had fallen away. Peter, he knew what it meant to fall short of the willingness to suffer for doing what is good. So we ought to listen to Peter. He knows what he's talking about. And fortunately... Peter's story did not end with his denial of Jesus, but God did something amazing. And God did something wonderful through the suffering of Jesus Christ. God used that cross. God used that rejection. God used that that punishment to accomplish for us the very best thing that could ever be done something so amazing and wonderful for the good of the human race and for all of creation, God used the suffering of His Son to bring salvation and life to us. So Peter can rightly urge us that if suffering should be God's will for doing good, then suffer, then endure it. And today he tells us, follow the example of Jesus and you will know and you will never forget that God will bless the one who is willing to endure suffering for righteousness' sake. So then Peter in this passage goes on in these kind of strange verses to recount some of the amazing blessings that the suffering of Jesus has brought to us. The first phrase we'll look at is there. He says that the suffering of Jesus was what made it possible for us to come to God. Uh, He says there in verse 19, Christ suffered once for sin, talking about his death on the cross. He suffered once for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous. It was unjust suffering. It wasn't fair. The, the, The just for the unjust. That he might what? bring us to God, right? Did God bring blessing through the suffering of Jesus? Absolutely. If Jesus had not suffered on that cross, we could not come to God. We could not be brought to God as Christ has done for us. See, the Bible tells us that every person has sinned, right? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What is the wages of sin? You know, death. The wages of sin is death. Every person sins. The result of that sin is death spiritually. We don't die physically the moment we sin. We will all die because sin has, has infected and affected us all. But spiritually, sin separates us from God. There is no way to undo our sin. There is no way to change our status before God as sinners, right? If you have sinned, do you know what you are? A sinner. We're all sinners here today. We can't change it. And there's no way to remove the guilt that we incur when we rebel and sin against God. But Jesus suffered once for sin. Whose sins did he suffer for? Not his own, right? He didn't have any. He suffered for our sins, your sins, my sins, On the cross, Jesus, who was righteous, suffered for us, the unrighteous, took our sins upon himself, paid the penalty, the debt that we owed, so that now he could bring us to God. 
so that now anyone who trusts in him, who believes in him, can receive the forgiveness of their sins and can be, and we'll use a word the Bible uses, reconciled to God, made right. We talked about Anya and the the guilt she has because of her relationship being strained with her father. All of us had a relationship that was broken with our heavenly father. But Jesus, through his suffering, made a way that we could be reconciled. We could be made right, restored as his people. So indeed, Jesus brings us to God. And that happened, this blessing beyond measure, because he was willing to suffer for righteousness' sake. Peter then says another blessing that the suffering of Christ brought is that it, I will say, it secured his victory over his foes. And we get into now this strange section here about uh, spirits that were in prison and Jesus proclaiming or preaching to them uh, the ark and the time of Noah and baptism and all of these things. And we're just going to kind of hit a few highlights here. So there are some different views about what Peter is talking about when he says that Jesus went and proclaimed to the spirits that were in bondage, right? Some people think this means that when Jesus was crucified and he was buried, and Peter says physically he died, but spiritually God quickened and made him alive. They say that that means that Jesus, when he was alive in the tomb, went to hell to preach the gospel to people who were dead and who had sinned and were in Hades or wherever they were or hell, I don't think that's what it means because the word there that that says Jesus went and proclaimed, it's not the word that means the preaching of the good news, the the word that's like the Greek equivalent of evangelized. Rather, it's a word that just means he went and proclaimed something. He went and announced something. I think, and I think because Peter mentions the time of Noah here, we need to try to put together the context of what is he talking about So what I think this means is that Jesus went into an area of Hades where God had cast fallen angels who had rebelled and that Jesus went and proclaimed to them his victory over them, that he on the cross through his suffering had conquered the forces of evil and his foes. And he went basically to announce to them their defeat was final and eternal. So why do we think this, and and what does this mean? And see, this is weird. We don't have a a lot of time to delve into it. But in the time of Noah, if you go back and you read Genesis 6, Genesis 6 has this this interesting uh, explanation that in the time of Noah, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were beautiful. And so they they went to them and they had offspring. They, They had children. And it says the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. Nephilim is a, a, a word that means giants or fallen ones. I don't know exactly. It's, it's, this is all kind of an obscure passage. Um, but the Nephilim, it is believed by many Christians, were angels that left their proper position as angels and came to earth and somehow took on, whether they possessed other humans or took on bodily form, they then married women and had children with women. And they weren't supposed to do this. Angels were meant to be ministering spirits that stayed in their proper place. And that in doing that, God cast them into bondage. And that was part of the evil on the earth that caused God then to send the flood through which he saved Noah. We heard about this through the ark, okay? So I think because Peter mentions Noah, the time of Noah, these spirits in bondage, that he's probably talking about the Nephilim. Interestingly enough, in 2 Peter, he again talks about, let me read this to you, these these ideas of fallen angels and the time of Noah. In 2 Peter 2, this is just for your interest, 4 and 5, Peter writes this, same author, He says, for if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, whom when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, etc. Again, in second Peter, he mentions fallen angels in bondage and then the time of Noah, right? So I think it's meant to point us back to the story in Genesis 6, 
about the Nephilim, which were angelic beings that God cast into bondage and hell, and that what Peter is saying is that one of the blessings that the suffering of Christ brought is he was able to go proclaim to the fallen angels who were consigned to gloomy darkness and hell that he had conquered them once and for all. Another blessing, that the forces of evil, seen and unseen, have been conquered by Jesus Christ. And that now God is simply being very patient to endure the ongoing evil and sin that exists, though the forces of evil have already been defeated. They're they're just awaiting their punishment that God is being patient so that many people can be saved. So I think Peter is again telling us another blessing that the suffering of Christ brought the defeat of the demonic forces of evil under the the rule of Jesus Christ. Another blessing Jesus brought was our salvation and our cleansing. We've talked about how Jesus brought us to God, but I guess we could theoretically say Jesus could have somehow brought us to God without cleansing us. I don't know. Uh, God can't look upon sin, the Word says. But Peter expands on the blessing that comes through the suffering of Jesus Christ, when he then talks about how God provided salvation to Noah and, his, Noah and his family through the flood with the ark. Now, I know what you're all wanting to know is what about the baptism saves you part, right? This is the thing, because there are people that will use this to say, a person who believes in Jesus, if they're not baptized, they aren't saved. And if they died, they go to hell if they're not baptized. I don't believe that. Most Baptists don't believe that. So we, we need to understand what is, is Peter talking about here? So he reminds us of the story of how Noah built the ark. God, because he was weary of all the evil on the earth, sent the flood, right? And saved through that flood, which was his judgment, eight people in the ark. Now, when we talk about baptism saving you, in that story of of Noah and the ark, what saved Noah? Pardon? Pardon? I'm hearing different things. Say it louder. Faith? That was certainly required, absolutely. Pardon? Couldn't hear you. Listening? Yeah, well, certainly, yes. Noah had to listen. He had to have faith. Let me ask you this. Did the water save Noah? Right, the ark did, right? So when we think about baptism, we have to understand the analogy. And he talks about that baptism corresponds to what happened with Noah and the flood. It it wasn't the water that saved Noah, it was the ark. So in baptism, is is the water what saves us? No, it's Jesus Christ, right? And I think Peter wants to be careful to make sure we don't misunderstand this. And he even says, we're not talking about like water removing dirt, right? That's not what saves you in baptism. It's not that the water washes away. There's nothing magical about the water or the ceremony or something like that. Rather, it is a picture of Christ saving us through God's judgment, right? We will all face judgment, won't we? See, we're not spared judgment in the same way Noah wasn't spared the water. Noah wasn't spared the flood. He was saved as he went through it. When you see someone get baptized, like Myron and Tammy a couple of weeks ago got baptized, grateful for that, praise God. We're watching them get buried with Christ and go through the the judgment, but being raised to eternal life, right? It's like a picture in a way of what God did for Noah and his family in the ark. And sometimes in the Bible, when the word baptism is used, it doesn't mean the water part. Paul in Romans 6 even talks about, he says, don't you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death, right? For Paul... It's not that the water was the thing that made baptism a spiritual reality. It's what happens that the water baptism is symbolic of. And that is the being baptized, immersed into Jesus Christ, made one with him. That is the being baptized into his death, right? Suffering with him, being raised with him. So when we read this passage, I don't think Peter is trying to say, if you don't get dunked, you aren't saved. He's rather saying that in the same way those that listened to God and believed him when he said, I will provide salvation so that you may endure through the judgment and be saved, Jesus has done that for you. 
And when you get baptized, what you're doing is you're proclaiming visibly the spiritual reality of what God has done. If you happen to die before you got to do this, the symbolic part, very important, very powerful, a step of important obedience that is generally seen as that first step of obedience someone takes in the church, you don't go to hell. I just That doesn't even make sense to me. So I think what Peter is saying is that, and I love this phrase there, that not as the removal of dirt from the body is our salvation and our baptism, but rather an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know what you and I can have, the blessing we can have because Christ was willing to suffer for us, a good conscience before God. Not the idea that we can stand and say, God, I'm a good person. Not at all. But we can say, God, thank you that Jesus suffered by taking my sins upon himself. And thank you, God, that now when you look at Eric, you don't see the 18 billion sins he has committed so far or the 138 billion to come, but rather because of the suffering of Christ, I have been cleansed. Not by water washing away dirt, but by Jesus' blood washing away my guilt. And I, a very sinful man, can now stand before God with a clean conscience and say, I have been forgiven. I have been washed clean. And I have a clear conscience with God. I can sleep well at night, not because I don't sin, but because Christ suffered for my sins and took them upon himself. And I hope you and I will live in this kind of freedom. I know that many of us struggle and we are afraid of God. Right? This is a reality. The devil will try to make us fearful. The devil will try to make us where, where the word says, as we said earlier, you can come before the throne of grace with boldness through Christ. The devil will say, why would God want to listen to you? You better not go to his throne of grace. Look at all the sin. You better try to get your life right before you try to go to him. No. See, a lot of us, we're afraid of God. There's this mixture of love and fear. And I think that we need to remember what 1 John says, perfect love. What does it do to fear? Cast it out. Whenever we're afraid to go to God, we should remember this. God, thank you for your love. God, thank you for your perfect love that you sent your son Jesus to save me. I'm not going to be afraid to turn to you again. I'm not going to be afraid to come to you and ask for your forgiveness again. I'm not going to be afraid to ask for your help again. I'm not going to be afraid to ask boldly. And it has nothing to do with me being a good person. Everything to do with Jesus giving his life so that I can have a clear conscience before God. Are you grateful for that blessing? Are you grateful? You can stand before God, a very sinful person, and say, God, I'm going to ask for your help and trust boldly that you're going to give it to me. Well, you know why you have that blessing? Because Christ was willing to suffer. Another blessing that came through the suffering of Jesus Christ. See, Peter's trying to tell us, if you have to suffer for righteousness' sake, do it because you will be blessed. Don't believe me? Look at the life of Jesus Christ, our Savior, and all of the blessings that came through his suffering. Now, one, one thing I want to know, and, and the final thing we would talk about, and I'll just mention briefly, is then he talks about how Christ, after his suffering, has now been exalted. He's been glorified. He is now at the right hand of God, and all of the other forces of, of uh, evil or darkness or, or good or evil, whatever, everything has now been subjected to him, right? So the final blessing we see is that eventual exaltation that will come for those that trust, those that endure, those that are willing to suffer for doing what is right. There is then this future glory, right? So what I want to notice in this is how some of the blessing that comes when we suffer for doing good is visible, but some of it's invisible, right? And what this means for us is this. Sometimes we are called to suffer according to God's will for doing what is right, and we won't understand why. We may not see every blessing that will come from that. We saw some of the blessings that came from Jesus' suffering. We saw that he was raised from the dead. His disciples got to see him raised. They got to see him conquer death, right? They got to experience his forgiveness. Peter got to have a conversation with the risen Christ and received Jesus' forgiveness, and then his, his, uh, his affirming his ministry, now you go and feed my sheep. Like Peter had some very visible blessings that came. Some of it we didn't see. Peter didn't see Jesus go and preach and proclaim that he had conquered the forces of evil in the, the gloomy darkness of hell. Peter didn't see that. It was a real blessing. He didn't see it. Peter hadn't seen when he wrote this, Jesus exalted to the right hand of God. 
But he, he knew it was true, but he hadn't seen it yet, right? Some of the blessings are invisible. Some of them are still to come. So here's the thing we need to remember, guys. If we are only willing to suffer for doing what is right, if we know what God is going to do, we don't trust him. If we say, well, God, I will do it. I'll be willing to take a stand. I'll be willing to suffer if you show me what you're going to do to bless me through it. We don't trust him, right? We are called to do it in faith. We are called to do it as an act of faith, an act of trust, an act of hope that God will keep his promise even when we don't see how he's going to do it. So brothers and sisters, if we have to know what God's going to do before we trust him, we don't trust him, okay? And the spiritual person is not the one that always knows what God is going to do specifically, but is rather the one that trusts God and obeys God even when they don't know what he's going to do specifically. So let me encourage you today. If you have the opportunity and God places it in your path, to do what is right, to do what is good, to stand visibly and vocally in your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, do it. Do it even if you think you might suffer for it. Do it especially if you think you might suffer for it because God has made a promise. If you will suffer for doing good, you will be blessed. And if you don't believe it, remember Jesus. Think about his suffering and think about all of the blessings that have come because of what he has done for us through his suffering. And if we love him, if we trust him, let's be willing to suffer for his sake, knowing we will be blessed. Let us pray. Father, I thank you today for your word. This is a hard topic for us, God, one that we keep looking at week after week in First Peter. But Father, my prayer today is that your love would cast out fear. Lord, when we, we think about suffering for the gospel, think about suffering for doing what is right, God, it scares us. Lord, it's, it's a frightening thing to us if we are not careful. But Lord, I remember and we remember that your word says that your perfect love casts out fear. Lord, it casts out fear that, that we have to live with fear of punishment from you, but also, Lord, fear of other people. And Jesus himself said, don't fear those that all they can do is hurt your body. If you're going to be afraid, rather fear and reverence and put your awe and your trust in God who can destroy body and soul, but thankfully who has sent his son to save body and soul. Lord, I pray today that you'll give us courage. Lord, some of us today might at this very moment be facing situations where we are being called to be courageous and we are called to be faithful. We are called to do what is right and good, even though there's going to be a cost. And I pray, Lord, for that one, you will give them courage. You will give them obedience. You will remind them that, Lord, if they do it, they will be blessed. Lord, for some of us, we're not there now, but that day may come. And I pray, Lord, we will be equipped through your word today in First Peter to be ready. That, God, it would become our growing desire to live for you, whether that means suffering or whether it means blessing, Lord, whatever it looks like. That it would just be our desire to love you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength so that we'd even be willing, it would be natural for us to be ready to suffer for the gospel. And Lord, I thank you today for this promise that if we will do what is right and good, we will be blessed. And we thank you that you've given us the perfect example in our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Jesus, we thank you today that you were willing to suffer for us. We thank you for every blessing that has come to us through your suffering. And we pray today we would be willing, if necessary, to suffer for you. We ask these things all in your name, Jesus. And we pray for your help. Amen.